Last time we talked about what mycotoxins were and what they do. I'll just do a quick recap of that, but then we'll move into what management options there are available at this time and what are some of the problems or, or uh, complexities of those things, and then, and then what we're really looking at if we want to get mycotoxins out in the long run, the social transformation that will be uh, required. So again, what are mycotoxins? It's from the Greek, uh, mycosis fungus, and of course toxic toxin is a poison. Um, mycotoxins are created by foodborne fungi and uh, things that we call molds. We have evidence of stunting and impact in the first thousand days of children's lives when they are exposed to subacute levels of aflatoxin. We know that uh, poultry are extremely sensitive and a lot of poultry death is due to um, uh, aflatoxin in feeds. This field was in Texas and this was in uh, uh, 2004, but they have problems every year in Texas. It's so hot and so dry there that uh, corn that's under drought stress tends to have higher toxin. This field had such high toxin levels uh, that, they, that it was rejected from feed millers even, and so the farmer was left holding his uh, maize and didn't have anything that much could be done with it. Uh, the pyramids in, in this picture show, the pyramids in the lower right corner show uh, what it used to be like in Africa when they were exporting groundnut to Europe. So much groundnut was produced that, that it created these pyramids of of, of uh, bags of groundnut ready to be exported. So you're seeing uh, human health consequences, which include, of course, liver cancer in humans, uh, but particularly for this audience, we're looking at stunting in children, animal loss and poor feed conversion when, when toxins are in the food, uh, outright economic loss to growers, and, and huge trade losses to uh, entire, the entire continent of Africa, but also others. Again, just quickly, aflatoxin contamination occurs in two phases. Prior to the harvesting of the crop, the, the fungus gets in in the field and it is associated with uh, crop damage or drought stress, for example, is a damage that can occur uh, because of high, uh, high heat. Um, it's nighttime temperatures when the corn is trying to grow, the silk can cut the grain and uh, cause open the grain so that, micro, for, so that the fungus can get in, and then it becomes toxic. Post-harvest, then the aflatoxin increases as the crop is uh, being handled and stored. Uh, it, it's vulnerable. The, the grain is vulnerable until it's consumed. And rain on a mature crop will increase the, the contamination with toxin, high humidity in the field or store. Any insect damage, this is showing larger grain borer, any insect damage, any improper storage or transportation condition will uh, increase the amount of toxin. So today we're going to talk about management options. There are, again, because we have the, the pre-harvest conditions in which the fungus gets into the field, there's some intervention uh, uh, points in uh, before you harvest, and then there are intervention points after you harvest. Um, one of the biggest ones, and we'll get into it now uh, in a few minutes, is uh, biological control. It blocks, the, it blocks the toxic fungus from getting into the crop at all. And that's just a preemptive measure at once, once that you've used biological control throughout the rest of the value chain. Uh, if you've had successful biological control, uh, you cannot get toxin because the toxic fungus has been uh, displaced. Short of biological control, however, you, there are not a lot of things that you can do. You can avoid crop stressors. It's hard to avoid drought and high temperature when you're talking about corn or peanuts because mostly those are not uh, irrigated crops. Uh, make sure that the crop has good fertility and keep weeds out. Anything that stresses the crop needs to be managed. Um, whether you rotate or don't rotate is, if you rotate out into another crop that is susceptible, such as a, a corn peanut rotation, that doesn't help. Um, 
if you can rotate completely away from a cereal, you're likely to be better off. But rotating is, is not terribly helpful because the, the toxigenic fun, the fungus stays in the soil and is viable for, I don't know, 20 years. It's, it stays there. Harvesting it at optimum time is important because it, it avoids weathering of the grain. The, uh, the, the husks of corn, for example, tend to loosen. Uh, as as they're drying and and so getting that harvested and out of the field, getting the corn harvested and out of the field and into a, a dry condition uh, at when it's mature is a is a good thing to do to help uh, avoid uh, more contamination. Uh, once it's harvested, uh, they a lot of in a lot of places they're allowing the the harvested uh, products to come in contact with the soil. I didn't mention that here. But you should never, never put the uh, grain or or um, peanuts or nuts directly in contact with the soil where it can pick up more of the fungus. You have to quickly dry it down, dry down the harvest to less than 12% and keep it there. You've got to control insects and rats in the store. Insects will drive up the humidity again by feeding and breathing and so on. You can never allow moisture to reach the commodity once it's dried down. Otherwise, the grain will re-imbibe and the fungus will uh, start producing toxin again. And then finally, right at the point of, of consumption, you can try to sort and winnow and discard bad grains. If you sort out anything that floats, you winnow out anything that's broken, um, and you get the bad discolored grains out. What, what what you need to see is a plump, fully uh, filled, not discolored, completely clean grain. And then you're likely to have a lot less toxin in that. I think as I, in, in uh, research I did, I saw that you could reduce toxin levels by 60% by just cleaning out the bad grain. Here, I've shown this before, but this is uh, corn and peanuts in Africa being dried on the side of the road. And here's a rainstorm coming in the background. This is going to not dry down very well, and this will become toxic like this. It's touching the ground. It's going to be wet. It's, it's, even if it looks OK, it's going to probably get toxic in, uh, pretty quickly in store. Uh, this is not um, a good situation. Now we'll talk about biological control and how it works, uh, the principles of it. There are a couple of different strains of, of Aspergillus flavus. There are L strains, uh, which are the green. When you see green on a, on, on a, a grain, it's probably going to be Aspergillus. You don't want to eat it. There are L strains, this type that produces this green forest, that don't have any toxin. They never produce toxin, and they, they, they stay a toxigenic, non-toxic uh, forever. There are also S strains, and these are, these are really more prevalent in very hot, dry conditions along the edge of the Sahel in parts of Kenya, in Arizona, in Texas. These are strains that always produce toxin, highly toxic strains. So if you're in a region where S strains occur, um, keeping the to keeping the displacing this fungus is extremely important. So in some strains, uh, uh, in, in nature, some strains produce a lot of toxin. A lot of them are toxigenic, and some produce no toxin. They are called atoxigenics. Atoxigenic strains can be identified and introduced onto a carrier. Sometimes it, it could be anything. It could be a, a starch ball. It could be another kind of grain. And you apply that into the field, and that helps exclude the, the toxic strains. It, it, it sort of displaces them. Here's some data from IITA that shows that here's a natural field. This, this, if you take a bunch of isolates out of that field, you take a bunch of soil samples, and you, you, you know, take isolates of the fungus, in a natural situation, about 75% of the, the Aspergillus flavus that you will isolate out of the soil are toxic. After you've put on the biocontrol, you can see that 90% of the strains that are in the field are now atoxic or non-toxic. This is, this is the displacement uh, of biocontrol. So you shift the strain profile from toxic to non-toxic.
thus aflatoxin is reduced with all this atoxygenic strain in the grain. It's, it's harvested in the grain. It goes forward with the grain uh, all the way through the value chain, and, and, and no toxin is ever formed in that value chain. The strains move from the field to the store, and it carries on for a, the, the atoxygenic strain actually stays in the field for a number of years. So it continues to work as long as it is predominant in that field. We, in this case, is IITA who has developed the technology, but there are a lot of different, uh, uh, I think Syngenta also has their own uh, strains that they're commercializing now. But the, the idea of using only native strains is to take strains that are going to survive best where you're using them. And it also gets around some of the, some of the phytosanitary issues. Countries don't like you to be moving, uh, toxic fungi around. Even though it's not toxic, they're, they're, it, unless there's a harmonization of understanding and standards, uh, it's easier just to promote the beneficial strains from each country and use those in that country. So the most uh, advanced uh, commercialized strain right now is called Aflosafe. It is actually comprised of four strains from Nigeria, and it's registered into a trademarked product. It has it was selected. These strains were selected because they colonize very well, they multiply very well and they, they are really good at reducing aflatoxins. So they made a high-powered group of, of strains that are now mixed onto sorghum. In this case, they're using sorghum as the carrier. And uh, what, what the farmer has to do is, at a certain time of year, um, go out and, and spread this carrier around in his field. He does it right before flowering so that, that the aspergillus uh, starts to grow out of the carrier um, early at, around the same time as the, the uh, flowering is going to occur and that the, that the crop might become contaminated. So in this case here, the little sorghum grains, you can see them on this ground here. And this is the fungus uh, with its spores. This is the non-toxic fungus with its spores. These spores blow up onto the crop and get into the crop. And therefore, the grain is... Um, now, it is, it is invaded by this fungus. You can see in this, in this lower right picture that the fungus is grown in the grain. Um, and it's in, it's in the corn grain, but it's, it is not toxic. It, and it can't be toxic. It will not be toxic. So here in Senegal, we can see an example. They were working in peanuts instead of corn in this case. They treated 38 forms in, in 2010, 40 farms in 2011 and 196 farms in 2012. This is spreading in Senegal, and, and, and they are promoting it around the country at this point for, um, for ground nuts. You can see the farmers out treating their fields. The aflatoxin reduction in the 2010, 87% at harvest and 89% after storage. In 2011, they had 82% reduction of aflatoxin at harvest compared to fields that didn't have the, the biocontrol, and after storage, 93%. And this gives you an indication of how much aflatoxin can increase in store. Um, so it, 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 some, some aflatoxin is in there at harvest, some is coming in at storage. Um, so 93% uh, reduction after storage is, is a great result. So whether we're talking about biological control or any of the other interventions, you know, field, good field management, good harvest management, good product management along the value chain, there, there are some complications to this. The social context is that food is, food is cultural. And where you're talking about staple commodities like corn, um, you're talking about really a food security issue. There, there isn't enough food to remove all of the, the staple commodity that is toxic. And of course, there's nutrition. Food safety and nutrition are very intimately into households. I mean, that's right, right at where people are preparing the foods and and uh, and eating them. Governments have the concerns about food security. They 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 certainly don't want to frighten everybody. And then you've got a problem also in that this is a problem that starts in agriculture, but has a health impact. And of course. 
a, a hidden health impact so that nobody really knows about it. So the farmers have to do something that that no one on the on the on the nutrition end um, actually know about, which is why we're talking to to I hope we're talking to this group. So what do we tell people? How do we how do we tell different different uh, sectors of the society what to do? Um, and so I'm going to go to uh, a, a bit of a discussion now about how we talk about this problem and how we get people to do what we need them to do to avoid being contaminated or, I mean, exposed to um, mycotoxins in their food. This comes from a book called Robin Hood Marketing. It, it talks about how social marketers, you know, the Madison Avenue types, see incentivizing people. And they, they what that they want to know is what do you want the customer to do? What is it that you're trying to get that customer to do? And we have to think of the customer. We have to think of who we're talking to as customers, not converts. They don't have to share our worldview. They don't have to understand everything I understand about aflatoxin. They, that's not a prerequisite to getting their attention. People don't have to know everything. They want to know what they need to know. They want to know what's relevant to them. And we can try to get them to see everything that we see the way we see it, or we can work from their perspective. And that's the social marketing, Robin Hood marketing message. So with respect to mycotoxins, what do we want from them, and the them is a list of, of them, versus what is their perspective, what they think is important. So we, we, ha we need to talk to governments. We need to talk to farmers. We need to talk to processors and animal feeds producers, urban marketers, urban and rural consumers, and international traders. And all of these are different kinds of people different with different perspectives and different, different needs. So how do governments see what we, want, what we want from them? What government ministries want, for the most part, is, is public, uh, a positive public perception. They want to be seen as effective and in control of the situation. They want to see that their country is agriculturally competitive, if it's a ministry of agriculture. They want to see that their, pub, their, their, their children are safe, if it's public, sa uh, public health, and, and so on. They want to be seen as effective, and they want to be as effective as they can. For mycotoxins, what we're asking governments to do are a number of things. We're asking them to internally regulate food safety, and that involves monitoring and control at market, at, at market levels. Uh, we're asking them to balance public health, food safety, and food security. And when they're most concerned about food security, these other two are going to fall out. We're asking them to oversee their markets and trade, which for the most part, most governments do, uh, because that's, that's the one point that's kind of a focal point that's easy to monitor. And we're asking them to enact policies that promote research education and extension on mycotoxins and also promote public awareness about them. What do farmers want? What are, they, what, what are the things that drive farmers? Farmers tend to want maximized farm income, they don't like income variation because it doesn't allow them to plan. They want minimize variable costs, so they want their input costs to stay the same. They don't want that co those costs to vary to vary much from year to year. They really don't want additional labor, uh, and they want to maintain their previous activity level, which represents they don't like to change very much. They want to know that everything's good. They want to know what the level of expenditure is that they're going to have to do from year to year. But in addition to that, if you surveys have shown that if you ask farmers the one of the most important things to them personally, they'll say that their household health and well-being and the well-being of their children is important. And and that's that is probably the best hook that we have. So this is from a study done by Reading University in the UK. Uh, these things, and then these are from studies that have been done throughout uh, and by different different. Uh, uh, researchers. So how do farmers see what, what we're asking of them when we talk about microtoxin management? Well, we're asking them to change their management practices. We're asking them to do some additional label. We're asking them to absorb an additional cost. 
the cost is income is yield neutral to them. It doesn't it doesn't give them higher yields. And it if if the market is not differentiating between toxic and non toxic, then it's yield neutral in terms of income. And if if it's if the governments are going to monitor and and restrict and regulate, then it will it poses the potential to have cause income variability or even liability. They may end up sitting on a bunch of crop that's too toxic to use. How do these big changes, because this is a change is just about everything that farmers don't like to change, how does this balance with the desire for the healthy household? Can we can we use that as the reason to get them to, to change virtually everything that they're doing? Now remember how social marketers see the incentives. Do farmers really need to care about public health? Do they need to know about the global public health issue? Or will they find that food safety for their families a great enough incentive to change their production system? And how do we see farmers as customers? How do we talk with them about this? Do we just want them to um, understand that market forces are driving this, or do we want them to understand the, the larger uh, context? Remember, people don't need to know everything. They, they want to know what is relevant to themselves. What are the strategies that we can provide to, to get farmers to, make, to change their practices? One way is to couple mycotoxin management with increased income potential. And that means you have to work downstream to, to uh, make it so that the larger scale marketers and um, industrial users and large-scale purchasers like Nestle and Mars and, and feed, feed uh, manufacturers demand mycotoxin-free uh, foods and pay a higher price. You can also couple mycotoxin management with improved productivity. The biological control, for example, costs about $16 a hectare to do. Um, they need close to three tons per hectare in order to pay for that 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 cost, that new cost at the market, uh, that's uh, um, not what most farmers in a lot of developing countries are getting off of, off of a hectare. They tend to get one and a half to two tons per hectare. So th there's going to need to be a coupling. And this is where I talk about social transformation. You've got to get a number of different things in motion at the same time in order to get to make it so that farmers can afford to do the management that we're asking of them. You can regulate and penalize. You can regulate the markets and make it so that, that the market women themselves uh, are going to be sensitive to this and, and, and demand clean product. Um, we could scare out the hell out of everybody with negative health campaigns at a large scale about their staple foods and, and see if we can create a demand for other foods. But these are all of these are a little bit complicated uh, scenarios for how to do this. Let's talk now about another group of people that we have to reach with uh, uh, messages about what we would like for them to do. They are really interested in ease of purchase at the farm gate. They're, they either are aggregators, they buy from small scale farmers, or they're buying from an aggregator. They really don't want extra labor. They want to know that they're stable, uh, that their transport and storage are stable and okay, that they don't have to do much with that. They want, of course, profitability. They want to buy low from the farmer and sell high, as high as they can in the marketplace. And they want to minimize losses and they want their customers to come back. They want to know that they have a, a, a consistent customer base. So what we're asking of them what we want them to do is to sell their product, whether it's maize or peanuts or whatever, at a higher price than actually they're selling it now. They, they have to give a higher price than it is now if it has low mycotoxin or aflatoxins in it. So what incentive do they have to do that? Well, right now they don't have. Either you have a regulatory penalty or at least a risk of penalty or in the short term, uh, one, one concept right now is to incentivize. The World Bank has a program that is incentivizing that middle, middle uh, uh, handler to giving them a bonus, actually, to um, demand 
mycotoxin, mycotoxin-free maize. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. That's a short-term solution. In the medium term, you, you really need to make sure that the, the, the market price differential is, is based on consumers who are demanding it They're, and, and are willing to pay this differential, They're willing to pay a little bit more if, if they can be convinced that the, the product is aflatoxin-free. And then finally, you want the government uh, sector to set in. And I believe that the only way to have a real sustainable mycotoxin management is is uh, via having this risk of penalty and or you know public opinion people's names are put in the newspaper if they have bad news or something like that and then of course everybody including marketers are going to be concerned about their own children's health so that is a place to start what maize consumers are looking for well for the most part we think that they're going to look for the lowest price most of us tend to do we want the best quality we can get for the lowest price. We want a convenient location for purchase. We don't want to have to change. We don't want to have to go farther if possible. And if you think about who's buying food at small scale uh, in, in Africa and South Asia and other places, um, they're going to be buying at very small scale and, and, and they, don't have, they have very severe time constraints. So it needs to be convenient to prepare and it needs to be consistent in the way it tastes and the way it cooks. So they don't want to see changes that, that make it not taste like what they're, what they're used to. So what do we want the consumer to do? We want them to purchase mycotoxin-free product for a slightly higher price. And we want them to seek vendors that sell Aflosafe maize. Somehow that maize needs to be logoed, branded or something, so that they, that they go and seek them. And why would they do that? Well, what would social marketers say about how much information the, the customer needs? How much information is too much information? And how much, does, how much does this purchaser need to know? And I always bring up, I think Lynn will recognize this, I, I, I bring up this advertising campaign uh, that, that I knew when I was a child. It was about a peanut butter that was being sold in the United States. And the advertising slogan was so simple. It was, choosy mothers choose Jim. That's all it was. It didn't say why. It didn't say what the difference was. It didn't talk about the nutritional value. It didn't talk about, and, and I think this actually was, at that time, they were starting to really regulate peanuts, and, and uh, aflatoxin can't be in peanuts. They go to peanut butter because peanut butter is a, a food for kids. So they target the mother, and so the mother, as she's walking through the grocery store, all she has to remember in the back of her mind is, I'm a choosy mother. My kids, my kids deserve the best, so I'm going to choose Jif. That's all it took to get a, a successful campaign and a successful uh, product out. So we could talk, we could tell everybody, or or if we got some very clever clever marketers in, we might find a different way to. Get the uh, get get the marketers and the consumers to move out Aflosafe and and mycotoxic free maize. There are about 15 cultural techniques. I just jumped back to the farmers. Again, the farmers are where it starts. We really need to be clear about what we're going to say to them. Um, it has to be worth their while somehow. And really, for this to happen, for it to be worth their while, a whole bunch of other elements have to line up. You've got to have a market price differential. You've got to have um, a demand that makes, that makes that worth it for them to do in the long run. To sustainably drive mycotoxin management, you need to have a number of things. You've got to have, in the first place, this is the chicken and the egg thing, but in the first place, you have to have affordable, low aflatoxin maize in the markets. You can't, you can't start a campaign in the absence of a product. The product has to be there so that people have something to switch to. Right now, the uh, comprehensive cooperative ag development programs that are funded via the uh, World Bank country offices, and uh, there are pull mechanism incentives that we'll talk about in a minute that, that, that we're trying, that are being tried by the World Bank as, a, as an experiment right now to see 
if if you can incentivize the co the uh, commercialization of Apple Faith May, you must have market faith forces starting to be in place pretty quickly in order to draw out the the aflatoxic aflasafe maze. Uh, in the long run, there 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 probably needs to be a health awareness. But again, how much health awareness? I would say that most people in the United States don't realize that aflatoxins are uh, being kept out of their foods. Most people here don't know. Uh, it's being regulated. Farmers know. Frito-Lay knows. You know, g growers are very aware of it. But most consumers aren't aware of it. So how much, how much health focus do we need the different groups to have? And finally, policy and the policy environment that is going to make sure that, that they 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 phase in a regulatory enforcement mechanism. And quickly about regulatory enforcement. In Europe and in the United States, there are people are testing all the time. The people need to are testing all the time. The growers know how to test. Silos, uh, aggregation points know how to test. Um, you don't have to test every marketer, but you have to test enough that they're concerned that what they get might be tested. And you have to have some sort of branding that shows that it's been tested, and it's clear, and it's free, and it's good for you, and it's good for the babies, and so on. So those are, those are policy elements, and they are sort of regulatory elements that governments are going to have to uh, grapple with. And, and anybody who's working with governments, even NGOs, are going to want to to work with the, the countries where they are uh, to, to, to think about how they, how they want to scale up their regulatory enforcement. Here are all our players. We've got developing country governments. They know, for the most part, about it. Certainly, ministries of ag know. We've got the beleaguered farmers, small-scale farmers. We've got aggregators who buy their farm and, and I mean, buy their, their crops in pretty much in bulk, sort of at the farm gate. And then we've got marketers. And sometimes the marketers are the same as the aggregators, and sometimes they're, they're secondary uh, purchasers. She would have to pay more to the farmer, and then she'll have to get her consumer to pay more. So this is, to me, if you're going to deal with mycotoxin exposure in developing countries, this is a, a very critical uh, intervention point right here, this, this market level. The industrial consumers are already pretty aware. Of, uh, those who grow poultry, if they're not aware, they can be made aware. But for the most part, feed millers are already using clay in feeds. They put a lot of, of clay, which is a binder. It binds the aflatoxin, and it 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 uh, removes some of the uh, bad effects of the mycotoxin in their in their in their feeds on poultry and and other uh, I, it, feeds are fed also like to to fish, trout, and and farmed fish. And farmed fish are very, very sensitive to aflatoxins. So um, feed millers are using a lot of clay. However, if you look at the economics of, of doing biocontrol rather than clay, biocontrol is cheaper in the long run for the industrial consumers and, uh, and, and, and will actually give better results. Clay tends to bind other minerals and bind um, uh, well, we don't know what else it binds. It's not melanitic clay. It, it, it captures molecules. So there is some, some uh, downside to using clay, but it's not as bad as having aflatoxin in the food. So you've got public health, food security, and food safety issues sort of all wrapped up into, into one large, one large uh, do list here. This slide is very busy. I apologize, it, but it's, it's, you know, because of the complexity of what we're doing, um, trying to do, this is the kind of program that the World Bank is testing out right now. It's 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 part of what's called Ag Results. That's uh, uh, supported by a number of donors globally. Um, the Ag Results program is World Bank. It's it's uh, uh, Canada is is a, a primary driver. Uh, Bill and Melinda Gates, U.S. EU. There are a number of drivers in the AppleSafe program. The idea is to try to incentivize the the commercialization of a product. And in this case, the product is the aflasase, the biocontrol. How do you get the farmers to grow something? How do you get, how do you get the incentive 
for them to grow this for the long term. And so in this case, there's a technical team that's producing the applesafe, the program management, the technical outreach that reaches the farmers and tells them how to use the apple safe. It's, uh, uh, and then the implementers are aggregators who have a bunch of small scale farmers in their, in their franchise. And they're the ones that purchase the apple safe and distribute it and make sure that the growers are using it. And they're the ones that purchase the maize at the end. And these, these implementers will be incentivized per ton of aflosafe maize that they that they produce or they bring into the market. And this is meant to go for a, a few years uh, to to see if you can get the, the enough implementers that there is um, a, a, a good market demand for aflosafe maize. And that with that, I'll wrap up and uh, let Lynn, lead us in conversation. Thank you for your comments. Thanks, Itty. That was great. It's amazing it's taken us so long to get this far in terms of talking about aflatoxins and nutrition and their effects when they've been around for years. And I must admit, I'm certainly looking at my sort of corn a lot differently in the supermarket now than I was doing a month or so ago before I met you. Let me ask uh, Cornelius and uh, Isabel and Kim if they have any questions first. This Afla safe, can it be used in any country in, in Africa? Could it also be used in the United States then? It started in the United States. I think in the US it's called Afla Guard. Mm -hmm. It's a different formulation. It's a formulation that was designed. The first place that used it in the United States was in was uh, Arizona. In Arizona, they grow a lot of cotton. Arizona is very hot and dry, and they grow cotton. And the profit margin for that for the cotton growers was to be able to sell their seed for animal feed. And mm -hmm. the seed was being sold to dairy farmers because it's very high oil quant content and very good for dairy. The only problem is that aflatoxin, if it's in the grain, it goes into the milk. And so there's yeah. zero tolerance. So they were the first ones. Their profit margin was based on whether or not they could sell their seed. And it has to be aflatoxin free. So they were the first ones to adopt the biocontrol technology, and they built, the growers themselves built their production plant in Arizona. Then the Texas corn growers, because Texas has trouble every year because it's so hot, uh, that they have trouble in corn every year, and the Texas corn growers found out what the Arizona guys had done, and they've adopted this wholesale now. They're, and so they built, their, the, the uh, Arizona plant is producing for them as well. So the, the plant that's producing the aflosafe in Africa is at IITA in Ibada, Nigeria. But this plant is, is quite efficient, and it, it's just produced enough for this growing season and probably the next for Nigeria. And it has and there, you have to have scientists in each country who are trained in how to develop their own strains. Mm -hmm. That's occurring right now in Kenya. It's, it has already occurred in Senegal. And so the team, the, 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 the team represented right now by IITA and the USDA ARS, um, Peter Cotty, are training scientists in, in countries all over Africa where they're developing their own strains out of their local soils. You could also produce genetically modified crops which would not or which would be uh, intolerant to aflatoxin. Would this be possible? Well, there haven't been any produced yet. If you use Bacillus thuringiensis, you know, BT, uh, and modified corn, mm -hmm. um, it kills the insects that feed on it. But that doesn't necessarily keep the insects from doing the first damage, which is to cause the feeding site on the grain. So okay. there have been mixed results, even in cotton, where you have boll weevils and things, where they use BT cotton, they still need to use the biocontrol. And the biocontrol would have no direct influence on, on higher yields, correct? It doesn't affect yield at all. Okay. No. I was really wondering, the, uh, the Harvest Plus, they are also developing crops, uh, biofortified crops. They are also maize with vitamin A and, and rice with zinc and, and wheat with zinc and, and, and so on. I, I think it would be also safe to use this one on, on a field which, which uh, is then uh, applied with AFLA safe, correct? Yes, that would be safe. 
Yeah. So I've already started mentioning to Howdy that when they do the Zambia trial for the vitamin A maize rollout, um, we should be thinking about whether some of them could have aflacase well, mm-hmm. because, you know, we would get vitamin A maize in, but, you know, if it's still got loads of mycotoxins in, the impact on nutrition may actually be wiped out. Exactly. Which would then yeah. harm the success rate of vitamin A maize, because we wouldn't mm-hmm. actually know which one was causing the problem. I think the one that, that bothers me is the sort of um, the, the control mechanisms in a sense, because whilst I agree with all the, the sort of strategies about how you would do it, the thing that worries me the most is, you know, very poor farmers are producing and they produce a little bit for market. And if the testing starts coming in and those farmers basically fail, then they don't have a luxury of not consuming their maize. It's not going to be a case that they say, well, you know, this maize has got a lot of toxins and so I can't actually sell it um, because they get no money, they can't buy grain as a replacement anyway, and they can't afford not to consume the maize that they've got. So we could almost risk like a bifurcation that the poorest people are the ones who end up consuming more sort of unsafe maize and the richer people who can afford to buy slightly better maize get better maize. So nutritionally, we could actually see the worst of all results. Well, right now, everybody's consuming. <laughs> yeah, but, but I mean, you could actually, you know, push it the other way, but it really becomes the, the maze of the poor. What to do with poor quality maize or yeah. any product is quite an issue. Uh, yeah. Some So uh, cattle feed, some feed, um, some feeds can bear a little bit more um, up to 50 parts per billion, but I think once you get beyond 50 parts per billion, you start having um, uh, deleterious effects also in animals. Uh, one option might be if a biofuel market develops, that local biofuel um, production could be could consume some of the poor quality maize. It wouldn't matter. You know, if you're going to yeah. use it for fuel, it doesn't matter. But you've got it. yeah, creating an, an alternate market is a problem. It's yeah. an issue. I assume also, I mean, this is, um, you know, bringing it back, it's a climate change issue as well, because you talked about drought and stress on the crop, you know, and so these areas are actually, that are already infected, are going to be more drought sort of prone and actually more water prone, you know, those extremes. Presumably, climate change is going to create an environment that's actually going to make the issues worse. That's correct. That's that's what it looks like. And it's going to expand the range. I would like to ask a question on behalf of Isabel. She hasn't got a microphone. She would like more clarification on how to handle consumers' desire for low prices. For example, how to encourage them to buy more expensive products. And if it's... Now, if promoting food safety and the health aspect that you mentioned, Kitty, um, if they are sufficient to motivate consumers to purchase more ex- expensive mycotoxin-free products? I think that's the, the big question. Everybody wants their children to be healthy. I think marketers who, who are good at marketing, for example, I suggested in Nigeria there was a, a, there's a man who who was a child uh, television star, and he now has a child. Cute, you know, chubby baby. You know, if you, if, if you brand uh, Afla Safe Maze for um, mothers and babies, and all the rest of the maize they use, they can, you know, it could be, I mean, I hate to say that you could use, that, that it's okay to use toxic maize ever, but, if it, the 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 really heavy duty impact is in the first thousand days, um, I think you can target mothers with messages. I mean, it might the message might be that you have to clean and discard broken grains and you know and clean them up. Make sure mothers make sure that the baby food is the best food in the house. Um, that would be a way to go. But how to get it out of the entire market? so that everybody else doesn't get liver cancer is a bigger issue. And that's where the regulatory comes in, I think.
sort of have a bit of evidence in the sense from the nutrition field. I mean, when you're looking at the first thousand days, we know how important the quality of the diet is. But I think the evidence on nutrition education has not shown a huge amount of success in terms of getting mothers to actually consume or give their children better food in that period. And part of that is the whole budget issue that, you know, animal source food and fruits and vegetables are much more expensive. So to actually try and then get them to not give their child what they have available is, is even more tricky. IITA is starting out by educating the farmers that they have piloting that it's a health issue for their children. Yeah. And that and that is, and if you convince the men <laughs> and the women, but I mean if you convince the farmers um, that that they need to do this for their own families, then the farm families, no matter how small, will drive it. I don't know if that's a big enough uh, incentive. It may be the way to go, which is just to educate. But you got 500 million small-scale farmers to reach. As I say, we've not done a good job on reaching essentially 500 wives with a message about family nutrition. So what could we then recommend also for small-scale farmers with their small, let's say, storage bins? If, if I understand there, you have also quite often the cross-contamination. Yeah, how do how can they clean the 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 bins or what what should we recommend the small-scale farmer? Which cultural practice is is recommended at this level, at storage level? There's a lot of work by Kirsten Hell on uh, traditional stores. And I think cleaning out the store is really important. A lot of the stores uh, in some parts of uh, the sub-Sahel, sub just sub-Sahelian, are, are actually made out of clay, which mm -hmm. isn't really good, actually, because the, the fungus happens to like dirt, you know. So it'll, it'll, it'll hang out in those clay bins, and I don't think you can clean those. Cleaning out the bins, cleaning out the maze before you put it in, just separating and sorting before it goes into the bin mm -hmm. and eating okay. the stuff that looks like it's got some insect damage first mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the, the toxin continues to build up over time. So if you can put your best stuff in a clean bin, your best and most dry stuff in a clean bin, mm -hmm. it'll last longer and, and be less toxic. But if you put bad stuff in a in a not clean bin and it ever gets moisture, then you start getting really high levels. So you're right. There are some messages on management if everybody realizes what the problem is, that they need to do something about it. Thanks so much, Kitty, for doing these two briefings. I mean, I, for me, you know, when I met you here and we talked, I, I thought this was such an important issue from a nutritional perspective. And it's such an important issue in terms of the ag nutrition dialogues that are going on that we need to really get this as part of it. From my perspective, I will be aiming to keep pushing this particular ball up the hill until we get somewhere with it. I think for the rest of the group, my sense is that trying to meet in the summer period from now on is probably not a good idea. So I'll look to sort of do more meetings potentially in September in terms of virtual briefings and that, if that's okay. Yeah, thanks very much. I found it very interesting. And I would also, Lynn, before you sign off, I would be interested to, to understand more uh, which countries, the World Bank or these initiatives or the EU or, or the donors or CEDA is working on, on this topic for, for us or for our ministry also to provide them with an overview where we could possibly link uh, activities. Uh, the German government has quite some programs in, in value chain development and I saw also some maize projects or wherever. Yeah? It would be great for us to, to get an overview where there are initiatives in aflatoxin control in a larger or a larger smaller aspect. I think that this is where the global food safety partnership could come in. We could get sort of Graham or somebody from the partnership to do a briefing potentially in September. That would be Amy Evans or Artavaz okay. that are uh, heading up the uh, partnership now. Brian okay. Bedard and John Lamb are also uh, trying to be involved with that. The idea with the Global Food Safety Partnership, if it's selected, if aflatoxin is selected as one of its first uh, uh, emerging issues to deal with, is to do a global um, analysis of where the problem is the worst, where the problems are, and who's doing what, just to try to coordinate among donors and, and among efforts to see right. who's covering what. And the Global Food Safety Partnership is about it's 
specifically about messaging. You know, what are the modules? What are the messages? What do people need to know? And so this is a, uh, an opportunity, I think, to, to really get our ducks in a row globally, the Global Food Safety Partnership. I think from our perspective, you know, the role of this work stream within the global donor platform is the, the linkage of ag and nutrition. This is so clearly one of the linkages between ag and nutrition. I mean, I think from our perspective, um, even though these briefings haven't been hugely attended, I think it's something that the members actually would want to get involved with. We can keep bringing it forward. We can do the briefing on uh, the food safety partnership and then, you know, see how we bring sort of more of the players from the platform to bear on the issue in the partnership. The partnership is going to be run, I think, in a sense by consensus on what to do next, what to do, you know, which which causes to pick up. Then it would be good to sort of assemble partners and sort of say, well, okay, Germany is working here, here, and here right. on agriculture, and we'll champion it there. You know, France is working here, here, and here, and they will champion it. The World Bank has this, they will champion it. USA yeah. has this, they will champion it. So we actually get a sense that, you know, you know, everybody makes it not necessarily a priority, but at least if they're doing projects that involve rot with potential mycotoxin issues, that it is brought out and it's discussed. We have a technical level of interest, and we have a... Uh, a donor level, but frankly, the big bucks are going to be in the private sector. Yeah, huge, exactly. huge. Nestle and the grocery man, grocery manufacturers and Mars and I mean, huge interest at the private le sector level. And I know IFC is mm -hmm. interested in this. So, yeah. um, you know, this is this has got to be a coordinated effort now uh, um, to move forward. I think we're going to have to get. Get, do some some real serious coordination here. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. I think we should continue with this topic definitely, and I will bring it also. We have brought it to the attention of our ministry, and they they picked it up uh, within no time because because Germany is really with within this huge agricultural program, this value chain development programs. Yeah, we are at scale, and we were we are also struggling in in how to actually uh, align this program more nutrition sensitive and this would be definitely an aspect where where maybe not all value chain projects but but specific value chain projects uh, should pick up on it and and improve quality aspects on yeah. on mycotoxin and then also we have the german government is supporting this uh, german food partnership yeah i will bring it also to the attention of our colleagues uh, as we are working there with the private sector and it's all about resourcing we are working with nestle and and, and with all this companies together. I, I mean, I suppose for me, I'm glad that these briefings have worked out as they have. It's one more stage in getting a groundswell to start it moving. Mm -hmm. And the more of us who are doing that, the easier it will be. Thank you, Cornelius. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you, Kitty. And I look forward to seeing you after the, uh, the summer is over. And I mean, Kitty, if this is a group I think that you would like to join, I'm sure there's not a problem. You know, obviously, we don't always talk aflatoxin issues, but if you're interested in ag nutrition, the U.S. is donor, and if USDA is not in that sense, but, you know, I'm sure you'd be welcome anytime. Thank you very much, and thank you for organizing this. My pleasure. Thank you, guys.